Hey, I'm Andy Chandley from 88.5 FM, and this is a here at home teleconference interview, this time with Stuart Copeland. Hall of Famer Stuart Copeland joins me. How are you, Stuart? Real good. Thanks. How are you all? Uh, living the dream. Yeah, I'm uh, asking you about all your listeners. I, oh, everyone. I assume you, you're uh, plugged I, into each and every one of them. I've got a list. Uh, Susan in uh, Canoga Park is doing fine this morning, although... No. Uh, I won't make that go on any longer. I want to talk about what's going on at the Soraya with you on uh, November 4th. Uh, the thing is called Stuart Copeland, Police Deranged for Orchestra. Uh, it's the music of the police, as I understand it, with you drumming, as you're known to do, uh, and a 28-piece orchestra behind you. How, how did this come about? How did a, a rock drummer like you get wrapped up with an orchestra? Well, my 20 years as a hired gun, flinty-eyed film composer... Uh, during the course of that, I had a forced education in orchestration. One of the main tool, you know, film composer has to use every known form of music, you know, for period romance, for future, you know, action, for comedy, for everything. So film composer needs to speak many different musical languages, but the main one is orchestra. So over 20 years, discovering the incredible things that an orchestra can do, um, is pretty inspiring. And so I've actually started over the last few years been doing shows with orchestra. And only this time I'm coming around. I actually played the Soraya one time before with a big orchestra. Um, it was so the- Ben-Hur, right? Ben-Hur, the, the silent film from the twenties. Nothing a film composer likes better than a silent film. Because <laughs> if we get to do everything. Yeah. Anyhow, I'm back. Uh, this time doing songs that people know and love. And although I write all kinds of new music all the time, this exercise is an exercise blatantly in your face nostalgia because songs that people know have an emotional impact that a new song will never have. Um, and these songs are incredibly great songs anyway, but the fact that there's so much emotional baggage attached to them, it is a thrill to go out there with a classical orchestra and get a rock and roll response. You know, people coming down, singing, waving their arms, dancing, singing all the words and stuff. For the orcs, who usually play serious music, it's kind of a thrill for them and a thrill for me to light up the orchestra. Because for me, I get in there. I don't just show up with the Ohio Orchestra, the, the Cleveland Orchestra or the San Diego Symphony. I get in there rehearsing. They're, by the time we hit the stage, we are now a band, a really big band, but it's a band. And... Um, with these songs, the response has been pretty amazing. I can't wait to get into Los Angeles, my hometown, by the way, and right. show this show to all my buddies. Uh, it reminds me of a few, several years ago, they came out with this, uh, the symphonic um, version of several songs. Uh, it was, I think, the London Symphony Orchestra playing um, Cars Drive and Bronski Beat. Uh, yes. A, a, you know, Small Town Boy. And uh, there's a version of, uh, I think, that, uh, Aretha's Think and uh, Ring of Fire by Johnny Cash. Really cool to hear that treatment to those songs. So I'm guessing that this is something akin to that. Uh, yes, very much so. It's, it's a rock show, but using this incredible instrument, the orchestra, to burn down the building. And they are so rich in their sounds, the different things they can do, different gestures they can do, different textures and everything. Uh, it's a, it's a new sound. And, and I, one difference, though, is that since I am actually a member of the police, um, I have been able to take liberties with the police material that no hired arranger uh, would dare to do. I mean, I do take some liberties with this stuff. This is police songs like you've never heard them. You still get your Roxanne. You still get your message in a bottle. But I've had some fun with them, taking some liberties with them. Um, because of all these chops that I've picked up in two different, very different places. One, flinty-eyed film composer. Other, playing in a rock band in stadiums. Those two different sensibilities joined together as pretty magic in, uh, ingredient. You know, when we played in San Diego, this outdoor arena, you know, the pretty big audience, maybe 3,000 people, all rocking and rolling to a symphonic experience. That's my mission. It's pretty cool. Um, and you've been doing these the film scores for a long time, haven't you? Uh, it was 83, uh, was Rumblefish the first one? 
Yes, yes. Now, actually, I was doing them for a long time. I did them for 20 years. That's a long and time. And then yeah. I retired from that. And now I do art for art's sake, pretty much opera, um, con, you know, concerto for, well, technically drums and orchestra, but as I call it, for stew daddy and orcs. <laughs> stew daddy and orcs. And I'm, I'm putting flinty eyed uh, uh, radio personality on my business cards. Yes. Um, Let's, okay, let's look at your uh, CV, catch everybody uh, uh, up on, on what you've done. Uh, 75, over 75 million albums sold, six Grammys. By the way, uh, just, just for your listeners' benefit here, those numbers, whenever you hear 75 million, it, it could be a 200 million records. That, those numbers are just made up. They, I mean, it's a kind of an estimate. I mean, they're not dishonest so much, but they don't know how many records they sold. They haven't sold. yet counted up the record sales <laughs> in Bangladesh. <laughs> you know, uh, our sales in Turkmenistan, Pretty strong, <laughs> pretty pretty robust. Uh, for whatever this is worth, four out of five of uh, the Police albums cracked the Rolling Stone 500 Greatest Albums of All Time list. You're in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 03, Modern Drummer Hall of Fame in 05, Classic Drummer Hall of Fame in 13. Uh, is there anything that's missing for you? Any any white whale that uh, any recognition you'd like to still see at some point? I want that accordion Grammy. <laughs> All right. And actually, out. no, actually. This year, I got a hold of it. I just, long story short, I, a, a musician in India making this album, a uh, very eclectic album, sent me this record. Amazing. And so I did a bunch of stuff with it. He insisted on giving me a co equal credit, even though he made most of the album. Anyhow, it's up for a Grammy. My new Grammy conquest, my intended conquest. I'm going to win. Gosh darn it, I better win. New Age Album of the Year via New okay. Delhi. Via New Delhi to, to the Staples Center for the Grammys. New That's, Age uh, Album of the Year is mine. <laughs> best, best of luck. Bone, bone shots. Yeah. Um, okay, so I'm, I'm music director at the station. I get a lot of calls from, um, from people working records, and I was talking to some people this week, and they said, hey, how you feeling? And I, I just happened to blurt out, uh, I'm up on top of the world looking down on creation. And they're like, I know that Carpenter song. And they yeah. said, here's a story. Uh, in the late 70s, I worked at IRS Records on the A&M lot, and we were next you did? door. No, they were telling me that they yeah. worked uh, uh, right next door to the Carpenter's office. And it just got me thinking about uh, IRS Records back in the day when uh, Jeanette Napolitano with Concrete Blonde was the was the receptionist and, and uh, REM was on the label and so forth. Your brother, Miles. Uh, started that that label uh he he was kind of the one that that got you signed in the beginning wasn't he well yes and no uh my two brothers were in the music business and uh one was an agent who brought the english invasion over he brought all those bands the specials the police squeeze you know flock of seagulls all these bands uh, and the other one was the record company guy miles the mogul and by the way he's just got a book out so your buddy who used to better run for cover because Miles is <laughs> filling the beans, okay? It's oh, called buddy. one step forward, two steps forward, one step back. Um, but yes, both of my brothers were in the industry, but the police started, you know, I started, I thought of a name, uh, I wrote a manifesto, uh, and uh, we embarked on our journey because the only way you can get hired as a band those days was to be a punk band. Those were the only bands that were working. So we cut our hair turned our collars up, put on our leather, got out our shades and started snarling. Um, and uh, then the problem was one of the members of the, one of the guys in the band started writing actual songs. And there went our whole punk credibility went out the door and we just had to put up with a miserable existence as the police making actual music. And that's right around then is when you became flinty eyed, I'm, I'm guessing. <laughs> yeah, no, I've been flinty eyed <laughs> since I got into show, when I was a roadie for Wishbone Ash. <laughs> yeah, yes, yes. Oh, I actually, I did you the great disservice of looking up on Wikipedia uh, before we talked. Um, and, and I knew uh, that, uh, you know, your brothers were involved in the, the industry as you are. Uh, have you seen this prime video show, though? Uh, Patriot is the name of it. It's about this uh, CIA agent who works out his his stress by by singing uh, folk songs uh, at uh, coffee houses, and it made me think. Well, my of, dad did that. My dad I know, was. It made CIA me think of your dad. Your dad has. He played jazz trumpet. Was his thing, <laughs> which is one step above folk songs. You know. <laughs> yeah. Much yeah, much cooler. Uh, number one, Miles Axe Copeland. 
That is yep. number one, one of the coolest That's a heck of a I've name. ever heard. And number Miles two, Axe, my 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 nephew is called Miles Axe Copeland the Fourth. It's amazing. I mean, that's a that's a jazz name right there. Uh, really? But also a musician. I mean, this just sounds like a a, a crazy a household uh, from from outside. What was it like to grow up in a house like that? Well, they're all kind of alpha types one way or another, but the, the craziest thing actually was outside. We were in Cairo for the first years of my life in Beirut, Lebanon. I grew up as a teenager at the American Community School in Beirut, where I played with my first bands and so on. So the world we lived in was, we didn't see it as exotic. It was the only world we knew. And I didn't realize how exotic it was until I got back to America. I was born in Virginia, left when I was two months old and didn't get back here really till I was 18. And the whole time I'm American, gosh darn it, because when I was growing up in what was then called the third world, everything that was shiny, new, modern, efficient, and honest was American. And um, when, I, when you grow up hearing of America from afar, and then you get here, I realize that I'm technically from here, but wow, I've got a lot to learn about this place. Tell me about your first drum kit. It, it, drums were your first instrument? No, trombone, age seven. Trombone, wow. Yeah, uh, and my trombone. daddy, who was a trumpet player, started me off on trombone because it's a big mouthpiece. And it has a, you know, a trumpet, you actually need an embouchure. It actually takes work to get, but a trombone, any damn fool can play it. My son in the fifth grade just brought home the trombone uh, three weeks ago. He's just- Here's another thing, he will get into Harvard. The only way to improve his chances <laughs> of getting into Harvard is French horn. Ah, okay. If well, you play, for, nobody wants to play French horn. Therefore, you apply to Harvard saying, I play French horn, you're in because they need you in the, you know, the viola. There are some instruments that are more advantageous than the other. Guitar, not so much. Another thing to write down, and he also plays viola. Um, yeah. So here's, here's hoping. Um, at the very least, he'll be able to, to play the sad trombone uh, at yeah. some point, I'm guessing. Um, so in your drumming, then I guess that explains why I hear a uh, little bit of everything. I, why I hear uh, Middle Eastern influence and a jazz influence and, and a, a bunch of different things. What do you hear in it? What, what, if you had to describe it, what, what would you call it? Well, you know, it's ask anyone to describe themselves and they will be kind of stumped. I mean, of course, I see myself as a genius, kindly, and intellectual, sympathetic. I help old ladies across the street. That's what I see looking at myself. You'll have to ask other people, you know, oh, what's really going on, you know? And the same is true of a musical identity because every musician has a musical identity, like a personality. And it's really hard for one to identify one's self. Good call. I'll, I'll just sit here for a minute while you do that. You know, uh, hopefully, you know, you can choose some nice adjectives. While I describe myself, yeah, <laughs> well, flinty-eyed number one, just that's the, to the top of the list. That's on your agenda. <laughs> what do you think you'd be doing if if you didn't become a drummer? Uh, photographer, journalist, writer. Uh, writing is a lot of fun. Something playing artistic. with you know anything anything creative like that. In fact, uh, one thing about musicians particularly guitarists, if I may. I love guitarists. They're my brother musicians. However, they are guitarists. And uh, most guitarists, if they didn't play guitar, would be on the street, unless they have a girlfriend. <laughs> uh, you know, they say, what do you call a guitarist who breaks up with his girlfriend? Homeless. <laughs> and the reason is the only way you can get that good on a guitar, you know, drums, you just start banging stuff. But guitar, the only way to get that noodling, wheedly, 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 is by doing it you know, pretty much all day, every day, which doesn't meet, leave much room for life, which is where the girlfriend comes in. Usually the the jokes are drummer jokes. I love how you're-, you're Yeah, I know, I this. know. This is great. This is what, great. Tell me, tell me now. I, no, no, no. What do you throw a drowning guitarist? I don't know. His amp. <laughs> Stuart Copeland, police deranged for orchestra. It's coming to the Soraya on November 4th. People can get tickets on your website, right? Yeah. StuartCopeland.net. Uh, that's right. All right. Or on Instagram. There's a link on Instagram. You go to the links thing and you can click on that. In fact, all the shows coming up are on there. Sweet. Uh, I'm sure you can find all the details on our website, 885FM. Dot yeah. org. Uh, Stuart Copeland, uh, thanks for joining us today on 885FM. It's been nice to get to know you a little bit. Well, thank you. Thanks for listening.
All, right, all the best. 88.5 FM, KCSN, and KCSN HD1, Northridge, Los Angeles. KSBR and KSBR HD1, Mission Viejo. A service of California State University, Northridge, and Saddleback College. Member-supported public radio. Streaming on the web at 88.5 FM.org.